Hey, let's talk about derivatives. So, what is a derivative? Well, it's an instrument whose value derives from uh, the value of other underlying variables, like the price of a stock, or the price of a commodity, or even a rate, like an interest or exchange rate. And the reason that derivatives are so important to think about is that they play a key role in transferring risks between these uh, underlying assets or uh, rates um, within the economy. The important maxim with derivatives and with investments in general is that risk can't be eliminated, uh, it can be transformed, but derivatives are exactly the mechanism by which they very commonly are transformed or transferred from one party to another. So what common types of derivatives are there? Uh, we'll spend a lot of our discussion on these. Um, futures and forwards are of course the most uh, common and perhaps the most simple types of derivatives. Um, and in addition, there are swaps uh, and options. The ways that derivatives are used are essentially threefold. Uh, they can be used to hedge, in other words, to uh, eliminate risk for a particular position, uh, but really to transfer risk from the current owner of that position uh, to somebody else, usually in exchange for some compensation. Uh, to speculate, which is to say, uh, to take advantage of the derivative sensitivity to the underlying asset, uh, to actually just take a view on future direction of the underlying asset without, uh, without actually hedging. In a way, speculation is the opposite of hedging. And finally, the third uh, biggest way of using derivatives is to lock in an arbitrage trade, a uh, risk-free profit, from some mispricing between the derivative and either another derivative or the underlying asset on which that derivative is written. Uh, but then, due to the ability of derivatives to transform risk, they can essentially change uh, the nature of a liability, uh, perhaps as part of a hedge, or uh, to change the nature of an investment uh, without necessarily selling off the whole portfolio and buying another. Um, think about temporarily hedging your exposure to the market with, say, short and index future. Uh, that would allow you to not actually sell off your entire market portfolio, uh, but simply have it be uh, hedged during the time of your ownership of uh, that short futures position. Now, Derivatives are, of course, traded over uh, in exchanges, but they're also traded over the counter, uh, which is an important alternative, and indeed is a larger market. Uh, trades over the counter are usually between uh, financial institutions um, or financial institutions and uh, corporate treasuries or financial institutions and fund managers or really any combination of the three. Um, the key point being there that most commonly over-the-counter markets are accessed by institutional investors rather than retail ones. Uh, but as a interesting anecdote on the involvement of ret retail investors in over-the-counter markets, um, you could look at the story in the big short. Uh, but the reason that over-the-counter markets are so important is that the volume of transactions is actually much larger. Uh, than that in the exchange-traded market for derivatives. So if you look at uh, this Bank of International Settlements data for sort of the principal amounts of derivatives traded in the over-the-counter market and in the exchange-traded market, you can see that it's literally uh, many times the value, sort of the notional underlying assets in uh, in both of these markets, the over-the-counter market blows the exchange-traded market out of the water in, its, in terms of its sheer size. 
Uh, so it's, that's why it's very important to know about and pay attention to. And in a way, this importance came to the fore uh, during the financial crisis, when Lehman Brothers uh, filed for bankruptcy in September 20, uh, 2008, um, because of how big their participation in over-the-counter derivatives markets was. Uh, this was, of course, a highly leveraged investment bank, um, and the issue of systemic risk in highly leveraged financial institutions at that time was not peculiar to Lehman Brothers, uh, but that combination of high leverage and positions in over-the-counter uh, derivatives uh, is what actually made it special. Um, indeed, it had about 8,000 different counterparties, and when the bank went bankrupt, uh, that actually meant that unwinding all of these complex derivatives positions uh, presented a big problem, both for uh, the regulators trying to create an orderly bankruptcy for Lehman, uh, as well as for the counterparties in all of these um, different over-the-counter derivatives contracts. Uh, in a way, this sort of accentuates why over-the-counter is uh, potentially more risky, because since it's not traded through an exchange, um, and indeed prior to this bankruptcy event, it wasn't a very standardized process at all, uh, it's just sort of a bilateral agreement between Lehman and one institution, and Lehman and another institution, and Lehman and a total about 8,000 different institutions. Well, that meant that each institution really only knew what its position regarding Lehman was, uh, nobody else knew uh, who else might have traded with Lehman, and therefore arranging an orderly unwinding of all of these separate uh, 8,000 bilateral agreements with 8,000 over-the-counter counterparties uh, really did prove quite challenging and showed the problem with the over-the-counter market and derivatives as it stood at the time. Uh, now, the Lehman bankruptcy was, in a way, uh, similar to other institutional problems uh, at the time of the financial crisis in terms of really high leverage, uh, 31 to 1, uh, which really meant that about a decline of 3 to 4% in asset value uh, would actually wipe out the company, whether it had uh, over-the-counter or exchange-traded derivatives positions. Um, in a way, one of the... Uh, overarching topics or points in this discussion of derivatives uh, is that combining leverage with derivatives, which are inherently levered, um, is really a bad idea. And that's really usually what has led to uh, many of the historic financial institution blowups. Um, on top of that, Lehman had a culture of pretty aggressive risk-taking, exposure to uh, subprime uh, mortgage, and this, combined with its peculiarities and its exposure to uh, so many over-the-counter derivative counterparties, as well as the size of these exposures, uh, where Lehman had about 35 trillion uh, notional value of derivatives to which it was a counterparty, which is, or which at the time was about 5% of the global notional value of uh, derivative underlying. Uh, meant that unwinding all of these positions in bankruptcy really did prove um, difficult. And the New York Fed did a study on this just because of the systemic importance of this bankruptcy uh, for over-the-counter derivatives. And they discussed what sort of possible processes a derivative position would take if it were actually uh, centrally cleared, um, usually through an exchange at the time. That would be a fairly... Uh, straightforward uh, bankruptcy process, but to unwind over-the-counter positions, it really did depend on whether, uh, for example, the counterparty chose to uh, terminate the contract early or not. And if not, uh, what sort of resolution would there be in terms of uh, any collateral pledged uh, to the counterparty? Um, this really meant that the Chapter 11 bankruptcy process, which usually was 
of course, the course of action to unwind um, any financial institution in default. Uh, really was hard to apply here, mostly because of this issue of collateral, um, since each over-the-counter derivative position was bilateral, um, only Lehman and the other party knew what collateral was pledged, uh, the other counterparty didn't necessarily want to give back that collateral, uh, which meant that the bankruptcy process was very ad hoc, because whoever had a piece of Lehman uh, certainly wouldn't want to give it back, and if somebody really should have uh, to be treated equally to other creditors of Lehman in this bankruptcy, uh, should have been entitled to some repayment due to this ad hoc allocation of collateral in over-the-counter derivatives positions, um, they weren't necessarily. So one of the outcomes of uh, the Lehman bankruptcy in particular, as part of the broader range of reforms in the aftermath of the financial crisis, uh, has been a reform in the way that derivatives are traded over the counter, uh, precisely because of this issue of uh, an ad hoc or less uh, predictable allocation of collateral. Um, really, the emphasis on regulation has been, since the Lehman bankruptcy, to uh, move away from bilaterally cleared over-the-counter derivatives positions and even make uh, OTC derivative trading, which stands for over-the-counter, of course, uh, make that more like a centrally cleared um, process similar to exchange-traded derivatives. So, Due to this regulatory drive, um, the, o the OTC market really is becoming more like an exchange-traded market. Uh, there are more standardized over-the-counter products. Uh, really, of course, the uh, reason the over-the-counter market was so popular was because it was very customizable. In other words, it was easy to create a derivative agreement between any two parties, uh, since two willing parties could write really any sort of contract uh, that they were both willing to enter into. But uh, due to the systemic problems caused by potential default in these bilateral contracts, uh, the regulatory push now is toward trading even OTC contracts through uh, central clearing parties, um, or essentially an intermediary. Um, they agree to guarantee both positions in exchange for uh, collateral pledged by both sides of the uh, OTC contract. Um, the trades are also reported to a central registry. And the reason why this reform is taking place is precisely because of concerns about systemic risk. In other words, uh, if you have an OTC transaction between two financial institutions uh, and one of them defaults on its obligation uh, due to some exogenous shock, that shock can propagate through the financial system, much as it did during the financial crisis, um, which will then mean losses at other financial institutions who were the defaulting institution's counterparties. Uh, potentially pushing them into default, leading to further waves of counterparty defaults. Um, so standardizing and centralizing derivatives trading, even in these sort of more customized uh, over-the-counter agreements, has been seen as a critical issue toward making the system more uh, resilient and minimizing systemic risk. Now, to give a brief survey of the types of derivatives contracts that we'll discuss later on, uh, let's begin with futures. Uh, a futures contract is quite simple. It's an agreement to buy or sell a certain asset at a certain time in the future for a certain price. Um, this is sort of in contrast to, let's say, a spot contract, uh, which we're all familiar with. Literally any time we buy or sell anything, uh, we're entering the spot contracts. We buy or sell an asset immediately, or within a very short period of time, perhaps with some allowance for delivery. Um, so the key difference here is a futures contract is an agreement to do the same thing, just 
at some point down the road. Um, and this, of course, has had a rich history uh, in agriculture, where farmers long ago realized that rather than sort of face the vagaries of uh, supply and demand, uh, drought, uh, whatever might affect the production of uh, whatever agricultural commodity they would like to bring to market in the future, uh, perhaps they could simply make an agreement with another uh, dealer in that commodity to actually transact at a specific price um, at a future time. So futures have had a long history of risk reduction um, or well, risk transfer, I should say, in agriculture, uh, but they've expanded since to uh, literally any number of underlying assets. Now, there's actually around the world a very large number of exchanges that trade futures and on uh, many continents and many countries. Um, the book, Option Future, Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives, that a lot of our discussion will be based on, uh, actually provides a list of exchanges uh, that trade a large number of uh, futures, so you can see where they actually come from. So what um, actually goes into a futures contract? Well, it is just a statement of what will be bought and sold, when, and at what price. So the futures price is one of the most sort of important aspects of a futures contract, and it is simply the price at which both sides agree uh, to buy or sell the underlying asset at a future time. Uh, now, because it's a price that is agreeable to both sides, and it's determined sort of by how many people want to buy the underlying asset at a future time, and how many want to sell the underlying asset at a future time, um, in other words, how many are willing to commit to do one or the other. Uh, if the price is set by supply and demand, that means that it's a price that both parties agree to, and therefore no money actually has to change hands immediately. Uh, the futures price is just one that both uh, parties find fair. Now, traditionally futures uh, were traded uh, sort of manually by people actually talking or perhaps if there's enough of them together yelling at each other on a trading floor uh, at an exchange. Uh, but of course now uh, with the advent of computer trading this has been uh, replaced by electronic trading. Uh, but the process is still very much the same. Whoever wants to buy the underlying asset at a certain time in the future um, will submit their uh, requested price, and whoever wants to sell will submit theirs, and it's simply a matter of now a computer uh, clearing that market, matching up buyers with sellers. Now, what are some examples of futures contracts? Well, you could have for example, an agreement to buy 100 ounces of gold uh, for a futures price, in this case, um, $1,100 per ounce at a specific time, in this case, let's say next December. That would be a complete futures contract. Another one might be to sell, because remember, futures can be used to either buy, uh, in the case of a long futures position, or sell, in the case of a short futures position. Uh, it can be used to sell 62,500 pounds currency at an exchange rate of 1.55 dollars to the pound uh, in March. So you can see that the futures price doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, dollar price or even any really uh, specific currency price. It could be an exchange rate instead, uh, where now what is being sold is one type of currency, and it is being sold uh, effectively for a price, the exchange rate, um, into another type of currency. But still, at some point in the future, let's say next March. Another example would be if we were to sell a uh, thousand barrels of oil at $40 a barrel in let's say next April. 
Again, we know what we are selling, we know how much we're selling it for, and when the transaction will take place. So, uh, going to this idea of the two types of futures contracts, um, if you have an agreement to buy, uh, you have what is called a long position. Uh, and if you have a agreement to sell, uh, you have a short position. And of course, the type of position you will take will really depend on what your goals in trading the derivative uh, would be. For example, if you have an obligation uh, to sell somebody else some commodity, and you don't have it yet, but you'd like to uh, lock in a price for it right now, uh, you might actually enter into a long futures position uh, to buy that commodity from some supplier so that you know at what price you must buy it for, um, so then you can reduce the risk of your obligation to sell it to whoever you uh, were planning to sell it to yourself. All right, so let's go through a simple example of calculating profit and loss in futures. Uh, let's say that we in January have entered into a long futures position uh, to buy 100 ounces of gold at 1100 per ounce in uh, three months time in April. Now when April comes around uh, and the price of gold in the spot market, um, in other words, right now, so when we talk about prices of the underlying asset right now, uh, we'll use the term spot price. And when we talk about the price of the underlying um, as specified by a future contract or a forward contract, which we'll get to uh, shortly, that would be an example of a forward price or a futures price. But the spot price is 1,175 per ounce. Uh, what is our profit or loss on this futures position? Well, the intuitive answer um, would be, all right, so we agreed to buy for 1100 It seems like if we were to buy in the open market at the spot price, we'd be buying for $75 more. So isn't this futures contract essentially giving us a $75 advantage per ounce with 100 ounces? That means that we are up um, $7,500. And that's true. That is indeed what the profit uh, to the long position in this futures contract would be. Um, but to sort of go about estimating in, the, in a more systematic way, and I suggest this for uh, the beginning when you're getting used to uh, futures math, uh, let's actually break it down uh, into steps. So the first thing we need to think about is what our uh, value of the futures contract actually is. Remember, we entered into an agreement to buy 100 ounces at 1100 each. So this futures contract is effectively, well, initially valued at 110,000. Now, uh, what's sort of the smallest increment in the price of the underlying asset, and how would that impact the value of this contract? Uh, that's what we call a uh, tick sentence, the smallest change in price. Well, what's the smallest change in price of uh, anything that's really priced in dollars? Um, there's some conventions for things like uh, bonds, for example, but uh, let's say for, for this case, we'll accept a minimum tick size of one penny. So if gold goes up by one penny per ounce, and our contract is for 100 ounces, uh, the dollar value of a one tick move would be just 100 times that. So if each tick is 0.01 dollars, the dollar value of that tick 
is going to be just 100 times that, or $1. And now we can calculate the profit or loss on the futures position by multiplying that dollar value of a tick uh, by the number of ticks that have actually uh, the prices have moved since the purchase. Now, of course, it's not going to be like all ticks, uh, including up and down. It's just sort of the absolute distance between the uh, initial price at which we entered into the futures contract and the final price of the futures contract uh, measured in ticks. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that the if this contract matures in April, the futures price uh, of 100 uh, ounces of gold in April is going to be the spot price in April. Because if it weren't that, you could literally just uh, trade between the spot and futures price right before maturity, um, making potentially infinite arbitrage profits if you were able to find a uh, spot price that is different from the futures price right before maturity. So at maturity, the futures price should converge to the spot price. So that means that if the futures price in April is now the same as the spot price, the 1,175, how many ticks actually um, has the price moved by? Well, it looks like that would be 7,500 ticks from $1,100 to $1,175. So with 7,500 ticks, at a dollar per tick, that translates to a $7,500 gain. Because for us, an upward tick is a gain of a dollar. A downward tick would be a loss of a dollar. So that is how we can get to that same number we started this discussion with, a gain of $7,500 for the long position in a somewhat more systematic way. Um, now, by the way, how would this change if we were looking at a short position? Uh, because remember, since derivatives contracts, even uh, exchange-traded ones, are still between two parties, just through an intermediary, um, for every long party, there is a short party. So what would the uh, short futures side of this contract have made out like? Well, uh, the initial value would be the same. The tick size would still be the same as well, uh, but remember now the dollar value to the short position of a one penny increase in the price of gold uh, would be negative one dollar. And therefore a 7,500 tick increase in the price of gold uh, would be a $7,500 loss to the short position. So you can sort of see how derivatives I mean, in this particular example, futures, but as we will go on to see, uh, really all derivatives uh, being usually structured between two counterparties um, are essentially then a zero-sum game. So since they involve cash transfers between two parties only, there's no sort of third source of cash, uh, you can think of it as, as a zero-sum game effect. The gain to one party is the loss to another. So in our case, the gain to the party long, the gold futures contract, uh, comes out of the pocket of the short party. And the two um, profit and losses uh, must sum to zero because they literally just come out of the accounts of those two parties.